On this Pentecost Sunday, I invite you to hear these holy words from the second chapter of the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared on them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at th this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, and our own native languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and on your sons and your daughters they shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. We again say good morning to all of you. We're so thankful you're here. It's Pentecost Sunday and Confirmation Sunday very special time in the life of the church. We also say a word of greeting to those watching on television and online, a special word of greeting to those in Magnolia, Monticello, and Mountain View, as well as those in our nursing homes and hospitals across the state of Arkansas, as well as our homebound, and anyone anywhere who happens to be watching. We're grateful for your participation in our service of worship as well. You will notice on the back of our order of service that this afternoon at three o'clock we have a big, special, and exciting event in the life of our church. Son Yung Kim and his organ recital, three o'clock here in the sanctuary. Please be here today. We want to have a full house, we want to honor him, and we want to enjoy beautiful music, which we will. So we invite you to be a part of that. You might recall last Sunday that I mentioned money for just a moment, uh, very briefly. It just uh, came off my breath last week. I want to let you know that we've had a tremendous response from the congregation, and we appreciate that very much. We certainly need your continued support financially and your generosity, but we had a really, really good week financially, and we appreciate that very much. It's going to help greatly as we go into the summer months, but that also means that we have to continue to be faithful and committed to the work and ministry of the church through Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. We're thankful you're here today. Let us pray. O oh Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. It doesn't seem to be as prevalent as it used to be, thank goodness. But do you remember going to a sporting event, whether it was a baseball game or a football game or even inside at a basketball game, the craze of starting the wave? You remember the wave where someone would stand up and raise up their hands and then quickly sit down and ideally the person next to you does it and on the way around so that eventually you cre create this wave effect. I never liked that. I didn't like it because it always interrupted what I was there to enjoy. And I felt this sense of obligation and something's wrong with me if I don't want to stand up and participate. So you had to do it whether you wanted to do it or not. And there were always two or three people that started it. 
and just two or three people could get in a football stadium 75,000 other people to do it. Sometimes a handful of people can accomplish something pretty extraordinary when we all follow along. We live in a world today of social media influencers. These people who are on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and Facebook who are influential in whatever it is they're doing. And so, because they're so influential, whatever they buy, we buy. Whatever they eat, we eat. Wherever they go, we go. A small number of people can have such an influential impact on millions of other people. Sometimes just the small can be huge quickly. A long time ago, a group of people got together for a prayer session. It's time to pray. Jesus has ascended to the Father. They're waiting around to find out what's next. And while they are praying, the Holy Spirit, as Scripture says, is poured out on them. And they begin to speak in other languages. It's not indiscernible gibberish. They were speaking languages that others could understand, as if the message they were receiving was important for the entire world to hear. And as they speak, the church is born into existence. We say that Pentecost is the birth of the church. Today is the day in which we celebrate the birth of the church into the world. And while all of that's going on, there are those who witness what is taking place. And they're critical. They don't know what's happening. They've never seen anything like this before. Suddenly and dramatically, people are acting like they've never acted before. They're speaking in languages they previously could not speak. What are they doing? What's going on? They've got to be drunk. That's the only thing that could be happening. People don't act like this normally. See, since the church was born into existence, from the very moment it was birthed, people have been critical. People have been confused. People have wondered what is going on with the church. And sometimes when we as the body of Christ try to be the church as best we can for the world, there are those who are willing to be critical. I remember when I was an associate pastor years ago in the church, the senior pastor assigned me the responsibility to raise canned goods and cereal and all kinds of necessary items for the hungry who surrounded our church. We had an enormous goal and we passed our goal easily. We succeeded and more. And so he said to me, with all these canned goods here in the fellowship hall that we've collected, I want you to bring them all to the sanctuary and place them in the front of the sanctuary so everybody can see what we did. And I said, you want me to take all of this and take it to the sanctuary? How about if we just bring them all to the fellowship hall? And he said, no, I want them to be a part of our worship experience. And so I, along with custodians, had canned good after canned good, boxes of cereal, everything. It was a beautiful sight. We filled the front of the sanctuary with all of these items to feed hungry people. And after the service of worship, a man came up to me and he said, this is offensive. I said, you're kidding me, right? No. Those people are going to eat better than I do. And I thought, that is not true. When you leave worship today, you're going to do what you do every Sunday. You're going to go to the country club, and you're going to have the roast beef at the buffet. Don't tell me these people are going to eat better than you do. And he said, this makes me angry. Can you imagine that? People being critical about the church trying to feed the hungry, the very thing we are supposed to be doing. But the church has always had people who are critical. If you have an alcoholic and anonymous group in your church, which I've had in most every church I've ever served, people will always say, I can't believe you're going to let those kinds of people use our facilities. Those kind of people? You mean human beings? 
who want to be ministered to and loved and encouraged and supported, yeah, we're going to let them be a part of the church. Since the inception of the church, there have been those who are willing to be critical, even when we're trying to do the work we have been called to do. But when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon us, even those on the outside who wonder what is going on, somehow, some way, are curious. So Peter steps up. And Peter says, we're not drunk. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. We are simply receiving the prophecy from Joel that the Spirit of God will be poured out on people. And people will have visions and dreams and hopes and desires that will come true. That's why the church exists. We are born into existence to be the kind of people who make dreams and hopes and visions come true for others who are lost and afraid and broken and in need. See, ideally, the church allows the Holy Spirit to be poured down upon us and we receive direction and empowerment from the Spirit to be the church. But the church has to be willing to be the church as we have been called to be. And often there are churches, believe it or not, who when the Spirit comes down, ignore it altogether. For a variety of reasons and for that respective church, they think they're legitimate reasons. But remember, if the Holy Spirit is poured out on us, it is God who is directing, it is God who is mandating, and we're to follow suit. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Years ago, I had a good buddy of mine who served a church in the inner city. In the 1950s and the 1960s, it was a thriving kind of blue-collar church. Most of the people worked at the local meatpacking plant, but it was an extraordinary church. They had a breathtakingly beautiful sanctuary, lovely fellowship hall. It was a beautiful structure. By the time my friend was the pastor of the church in the 1990s, things were not the same. The neighborhood had changed dramatically. The demographics were different. And the church was unwilling to adjust accordingly. And so the church decided that the best thing they could do, instead of reaching out to the community, to the people closest to them, to do the work of Jesus Christ, they said, we don't want those kind of people in our church. So they voted to close. And then they decided the most unusual of things, which I never thought I would be a part of, but I attended. They decided to make sure the church closed for good, so they had a funeral for the church. Can you imagine? They literally had a service of worship. And my buddy, who had been the former pastor of that church years earlier, said, I got to go and I want you to go with me. And I said, I got to go. I don't, I've never been to a funeral for a church. What is this all about? They had eulogies. They had people stand up and talk about the church as if it had been a human being. I remember when the church was young and we didn't, they went through all the things that they had done. It was the most depressing horrible experience as you can imagine because it kept ringing through our heads you don't have to be closing and you don't have to die and you certainly don't have to have a funeral they had the appropriate hymns that you would sing at the funeral of a loved one who dies and they proudly closed down their church it was sickening I went by that church several years later. It was in a complete state of disrepair. It had been vandalized, graffiti written all over the church. People had broken in and stolen whatever was left to steal. Golly, when the church hears the presence of God and feels the presence of God and sees the presence of God and refuses to act accordingly, the next thing you know, there's gonna be a funeral because the church is dead. So we remind ourselves that we are to be filled with light and life. And the way we experience that and the way we thrive as a church is to allow the Holy Spirit to be poured out on us, listen to God, and respond accordingly. What other institution do you know of that week after week, day after day, year after year, gets people of all interests, all ages, different occupations, 
who live in different neighborhoods together to do common work for the greater good of humanity. Where do you get so many people who participate in activities intergenerationally, different ages, and they get together and they do the work we've been called to do for the greater good? It is through the life of the church when the church listens to the Spirit and responds accordingly. And when we do what we have been called to do and we listen to the Holy Spirit as it descends upon us and we do the work that we are supposed to be doing day after day, the grunt work, the mundane, the routine, the extraordinary, we make a staggering difference in the world. God created the church for a purpose, for a reason, and on today's date, Pentecost Sunday every year, we give God thanks for the glory of being a part of the life of the church of Jesus Christ. Which means that everybody has the spirit poured out upon them who are a part of the life of the church, which means everybody has the same responsibility and obligation to participate. You're not here just to receive. That's part of it. But you're here to give, to give of yourself in a variety of ways. You know that. Some choose to do it and some choose to ignore it. But it's a responsibility given to us by the Spirit to be fully who God would have us to be through the life of the church. And again, some people see the church like a convenience store where you can run in real quickly, get what you need, and get out of there before you do anything else. You're long gone. Years ago, I was serving a church in a community where the biggest industry in town was tourism. So there were people there all the time from all over the state, literally all over the country, out on the lake or visiting the town square or staying in one of the bed and breakfasts, whatever it may be. And one day during the middle of the week, I left my office to go down to the other side of the church for some reason. I can't really remember why. We had these really, really long, wide hallways because we had just built this new family life center. And down at the very end of the hallway were these big glass doors. And as I was starting my journey down the hallway to go wherever I was going, the glass door opened up and I noticed somebody and I thought to myself, surely that's not what I'm seeing. There was a man who came in probably in his mid fifties with no shirt on and shorts way too short, rollerblading down the church hallway. And so having never had that experience before, for a moment, I was taken aback and not sure what to say. And finally, I said, sir, can I help you? And he said, uh, hey, listen, I'm looking for the pastor. And I said, well, I am the pastor. And he said, no, I don't want the youth pastor. I want the senior pastor. I said, dead gummit, I am the senior pastor. He said, all right, here's what I want. I said, oh, really? He said, listen, my girlfriend's over at the b and &B. I'm going to go home, get a shower. We're going to come back. You're going to marry us. I said, excuse me? He said, yeah. Don't you know what you do in the church? You do what we tell you to do, right? I said, what church do you attend? He said, well, I don't go to church. But I hear this is the place to come, so uh, I'm going to go back and get her. I'll be back in an hour. I said, man, this is not Las Vegas. You don't just walk in here, pay a fee, and get married. He said, oh, I got to pay something to get married? I said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And I said, please take off your rollerblades and put on a shirt. And he left. I've never seen him since. I didn't know his name. I don't know anything about him. But I think there are people like that sometimes who believe the church is just a place for them to go in and get serviced. And then when they've received whatever it is they want, they just go on about life. When the Holy Spirit is poured out upon us, we are empowered in the moment to be different from the world to put other people before self, to be concerned about doing the work we have been called to do effectively and on a daily basis. Because notice what the scripture says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The primary place and the primary institution and the primary group of people in which that happens is the church of Jesus Christ. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And notice the church is born into community. It's not born individually. It is born as a group of people 
who empowered other people by the Spirit and other people by the Spirit to such a degree that we are here today as a result of a small group of people who created a wave of enthusiasm and excitement that would change human history, all because the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. So you think about Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church and what it is we can do for the world, what this church has a long history of doing and what it will continue to do because we listen to the Holy Spirit. Will there be people who are critical of what we do and what we say? Oh, yes, there will be. Will there be people who don't understand why? Yes, there will be. Do we let that interfere with the work we know we are called to do? Never. When the Spirit is poured out, it's amazing what happens because people do things that they don't have to do, but they want to do, and they have to do it. You think about in this church, how many people we have volunteer with the children and the youth who teach adult Sunday school. They're not getting compensated for that. They do it because they want to do it. They feel the Spirit leading them to do it. How many people in this congregation volunteer passing out diapers, or feeding the hungry, or sorting clothes to give to those who don't have clothes to wear. They don't do that. That takes a lot of time, a lot of energy and effort, and they do that because they want to do it. They feel compelled to do it. They have a desire to do it. How many people in this church volunteer in a variety of ways to be ushers, to sing in the choir, to be a part of the altar guild? Whatever it may be in the life of the church, we have people over and over and over again who do great good. People who give financially to support the work of the church. That's their money, but it's not their money because they know it belongs to God and they're willing to give back a portion of that because they know it's not theirs to begin with. Those are people who have had the Holy Spirit poured upon them and they know it and they respond accordingly and thank God for those people which affords us another opportunity for those individuals out there who think the church is nothing but a convenience store where they go in and get what they want and leave, to remind them time and time again, you come in, you do good, and you'll feel so much better for having done it. We are a part of a community, the church born into existence as a group of people. Paul Tournier said there are two things in life you can never do alone. One is get married. The other is be a Christian. It is not a solitary act on our part. It is a community-wide event that makes an extraordinary difference. So we say to the world on this Pentecost Sunday, come and be a part of something extraordinary. Let the Spirit be poured upon you, and you can do great good, and you'll feel so good. Thank God for the church of Jesus Christ. We would be nowhere without the church, but we are somebody making a profound difference for the sake of Jesus Christ because of the church. Started with a handful a long time ago. And human history as a result of the power of the Holy Spirit being poured out will never, thank God, never be the same. Hallelujah. Amen.